thank you. Uh, to the ACT and Regions uh, Citizen Science chapter of AXA. Um, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, of all the lands on which we meet today. And to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and also to extend respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us and to acknowledge the amazing um, things that they've done in terms of stewardship for this land for so many hundreds and thousands of years. So welcome everybody. Um, this is an, a, a presentation by Uta Wen and I'll be introducing her, but just a little housekeeping. Can you stay muted please throughout the presentation? Um, and for bandwidth considerations, you might consider turning off your videos. Um, if you've got questions during the presentation, there will be a discussion period at the end of that. And um, please enter your questions into the chat and we'll try and sort them and ask them at the end of the session. And um, Uta's very kindly agreed to let us uh, record the session. So we will make it available uh, fairly shortly. <clears throat> so we'd like to uh, welcome Uta Wen, uh, who's an Associate Professor of Water Innovation Studies and the head of the Knowledge and Innovation Studies uh, group at IHE Delft. Um, and we're very honored to have her here. Um, it's, uh, she's speaking from the Netherlands and uh, she's a, a, an eminent social scientist with a background in information and comms technology um, with over more, more than 20 years of it, uh, research international development experience. Um, IHE Delft is associated with UNESCO um, and its mission is capacity development uh, in partnership. And they see that as being key to addressing today's water challenges. Um, so you can see how well it aligns with all the citizen science work. And Uta has been at the forefront and remains at the leading edge of what happens in the citizen science movement um, in Europe, but also across the world. Um, and she's worked in a number of different countries, Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And she'll be talking about some of those uh, initiatives tonight. Um, and she's, she's also on the OECD Water Governance Initiative um, and is cu currently chairing two of the We Observe Communities of Practice. And she co-chairs the uh, Community of Practice on Citizen Science and Open Science. And I'm one of the other co-chairs and I've worked with Uta on a number of initiatives over the years and feel extremely privileged um, to, to be working with her. And it's really exciting to, uh, to explore what we can do together. And tonight, um, Uta is going to be talking about We Observe as an initiative um, under the uh, Horizon 2020. And it's, it's not a primary project, but it's an, a really important project but it, because it's seen as a, um, a coordination and support cutting across and supporting many of the citizen science initiatives and projects um, which are funded under Horizon 2020 in Europe. So it's a, a critical structural approach that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, and I think that's what's exciting to us here in Australia. Uh, it's an exploration of how we can do things together uh, as groups and communities. So without further ado, uh, Uta, can I pass over to you? And we look forward to, to listening to your presentation. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Libby, and it's nice to e meet you all. Uh, and indeed, Libby and I work together in the context of communities of practice, um, and that's also the, the topic for tonight, um, where I'd like to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in the We Observe project, where one of the foci was to see how we can really consolidate and share knowledge amongst this vast community of citizen science practitioners. 
So just a little bit of background about the We Observe project. Indeed, it's uh, what we call a coordination and support action. And it brought together uh, already four projects that were running at the time that were setting up uh, what we call in Europe citizen observatories, which are a special form of citizen science projects that are very close link uh, to, to policy, trying to have policy impact, bringing in policymakers right from the start, and also a project that we had set up in the previous framework um, under the FP7, the WeCensored project. So already the consortium started off with a strong base of, of running projects at the time, um, but our remit was much broader. Uh, it was very much to say, how can we really bring this large community of citizen science practitioners together uh, way beyond uh, the sister projects, uh, but the many citizen science projects that we have, particularly in Europe, but also on a global level. And when we talk about these projects, it's so often so easy just to talk about projects, but projects are made up of people. Uh, and therefore the practitioners who really run these projects were one of the focal areas that we had uh, in We Observe. And we wanted to help um, address some of the key challenges. We all, I think, quite aware of, of the increasing interest in citizen science, but it doesn't mean everything is easy. So in We Observe, we try to address three main challenges. One was the awareness of citizen science, citizen observatories. Many people still don't know about it or they have misconceptions. They're only focused about uh, concerns about data quality, for example, don't quite see the rich potential of them. Um, similarly, the acceptability. Those people who are um, a bit more aware um, often have some concerns. Uh, we'd see particularly on, on, on the side both of uh, more traditional scientists or decision makers that they have concerns regarding uh, the outputs of citizen science. There are also um, concerns regarding inclusivity. And then also the sustainability. Many of the citizen science initiatives are of course funded on a project basis. And that means once the project um, uh, finishes, funds run out and it's very often very difficult to sustain such initiatives. So these were the three main uh, challenges that uh, on, uh, we observe at large try to address um, but also in particular, we try to uh, focus on with the communities of practice that we set up. Now, what are communities of practice? Some of you may be aware, some of you may be participating in communities of practice. So in principle, we can say communities of practice are people who share a common concern or a passion for something that they do, and they jointly want to learn how to do this better. So it's in a particular domain, they form a community in which they reflect, and it's also a safe haven, if you like, in which they can um, share difficulties that they have, but they share also very much also the, um, the experiences that they've built up from practice. Now, coming back to the challenges, we set up um, four distinct uh, communities of practice that cut across the different challenges in different extents because they were had a specific thematic focus. So, for example, the first um, community of practice was focused on co-design and engagement. How can we co-design citizen science, citizen observatories? How can we sustain stakeholder engagement to share practices, uh, strategies with that? The second community of practice was focused on the impact and value of citizen science for governance, for decision making, feeding into poli policy processes, and moreover, how can we measure this? Thirdly, very, with a very technical focus, um, the interop COP, as we call it, focused on interoperability um, among different data types, standardization issues uh, of data and, and apps. And finally, last but not least, the SDG COP focused very much on the links between citizen science and the sustainable development goals. So let me um, look into uh, the, the co-design aspects because community of practice is more than saying, hey, we're a bunch of people, let's get together and do good things. There are actually ways of setting them up so that we can ensure that they provide value to the participants. That's why everybody makes time for them. So the co-design part, we can, we can boil it down to an initiation phase uh, and holding a number of co-design workshops, one or more, depending on the setting, and then really starting the initiatives. So the initiation in this case, of course, came from the project. We had funds, we had done this initial analysis of what we thought were important topic areas that we wanted to launch um, the, the We Observe Communities of Practice on. 
but you know these are big umbrella subjects co-design impact sdgs you know it didn't mean that we nailed down everything the whole point was to see let's gather citizen science practitioners who are interested in co-design practices or let's gather also those interested in the sdgs and links with the sdgs so for each of those we had a dedicated co-design uh, workshop with a structured approach common across all the um, communities of practice with uh, breakout groups really um, building the objectives and, and the focus and purpose of each cop bottom up uh, from the community of practitioners, reporting back, and then taking this material away, distilling it in a draft inception report that was then uh, vetted by this new community and used then uh, as an action plan to start our activities. Now, oh, this is where, where things are slowing down a bit, but in principle, co-design is just one of four stages. I mentioned the initiation um, already. Uh, we need to plan the fact that we're going to hold co-design workshops, then we do hold the co-design workshops. But this is then when we get into the third phase, the implementation, which is, of course, the core of what the COP does. This is when people work together in different ways. Now, they don't necessarily work together forever. Also, we observe had a certain funding period. So for us, very recently, at the beginning of this year, came the stage gate process to decide, okay, what is it we want to do? The funding runs out, but what does it mean for the communities of practice? Do we want to continue? Um, so that's what happens in the stage gates, uh, specific moments in time uh, when we assess whether the community of practice still adds value to its participants. We also need certain ingredients per stage. First of all, each stage has a particular purpose. We're not just muddling around, there are things very targeted. So we have specific steps and processes that we are completed at each stage. We also used certain tools um, and we of course also needed some resources. Uh, as Libby also knows from the community of practice that we mm -hmm. co-chair, quite a lot of effort is involved. Um, so there typically each community of practice has a co-chair, has some support staff to help with uh, activities. And finally, also the different stages have different forms of communication. For example, in the launch stage, we need to make the larger community aware that we're about to launch these communities of practice and invite people in. So you can see the stages again along the top, initiation, co-design, implementation and stage gate. And I will talk a little bit more about these different forms of what happened in the implementation phase. And then in, in the uh, first column, the purpose, steps, processes, tools, personnel resources and communication. So this is what our model, our way to, um, to setting up and running Reobserve Cops actually looks like. Uh, don't worry, I won't talk you through every cell here, but it's just to highlight, you know, the different things really happen in each stage, different resources are required and quite some, quite some careful attention uh, is helpful if you can pay that uh, to bringing things together. So what happened actually? We had these four communities of practice, we launched them, um, and three years later, um, we have a, a quite a consolidated number of uh, members per COP. So we have uh, between a range of 120 to 150 members per COP, and in, in fact, including even uh, members uh, from, from AXA itself. Um, and we also had uh, task forces for specific activities that are then much smaller um, constellations, uh, sometimes three, five, eight people working in, in such a task force. Um, we see a really good geographical spread, not only within Europe, but certainly uh, around the globe. Um, in terms of membership, yes, it is tilted a little bit uh, towards academia and, and research organizations, um, but we have really good representation of public sector organizations, particularly uh, agencies related to the SDG, formal monitoring SDG processes in the SDG COP, uh, UNESCO and some of the COPs, and um, also uh, some of some NGOs, as well as a very small number of private sector organizations. So that really, is nice in that sense that it really brings together this very diverse community of citizen science practitioners, because it's not just scientists who we conceive as citizen science practitioners. Of course, there are many, uh, many different types of organizations these days engaging uh, in citizen science. But let me also uh, point out the sister COP uh, that uh, Libby had already mentioned, the citizen science and open science COP, which we are co-chairs together with Claudia Goebel. Uh, we launched this only last year in July, and we launched it online. So um, the, uh, the We Observe Cops, we had the luxury of still doing that in face-to-face -face workshops. 
when we set up this COP, we were, of course, all facing the COVID crisis around the world. So we launched it online in, in two different online workshops to make sure people had um, uh, suitable time zones. So they had a chance to, to attend one of the launch workshops. And we now have a strong member base with more than 150 members uh, from the, around the globe. But not only that, this particular COP has already provided really strong contributions to the process which kickstarted uh, its birth, let's say, because the UNESCO process of setting up the um, recommendation of open science was going on and needed a counterpart to speak to the citizen science community. And as a response, we set up the citizen science and open science community, wrote a short paper, produced a formal statement from this community of practice on the first draft, and also participated as observer in the recent intergovernmental meetings. So it really shows nicely that Bringing together these practitioners, of course, is useful for the practitioners themselves to join, jointly learn and, and um, exchange about practices, but it's also a really good way of feeding into important policy processes, such as the, the recommendation on open science. But, you know, at this stage, you may be wondering, this all sounds nice, but what do you guys actually do? So some of the activities are regular telcos. So we have rather um, uh, strict, not strict, but regular uh, meetings every month. Uh, so we get together uh, in each of these communities of practice, um, have detailed discussions, have, have um, a pre-agreed agenda, and often um, have, have some of our own members as speakers uh, to spark the discussion. We also form task forces, as I mentioned, because sometimes we have to produce specific outputs, be it for a conference session, be it a paper, uh, or in the interop COP, when they want to test um, uh, tools and approaches, they have an interoperability experiment. Joint networking, um, this is also, we've, we've seen, we've prepared jointly for a number of conferences, so different members get together, um, meet at the conferences, and that's, of course, all nice, and those were the days when we could do this face-to-face, -face, now we do it online. Um, but a big part of the activities is also outreach, giving presentations, such as this one, to other initiatives, other organizations, to institutions, um, and engaging with um, bodies such as GEO and standardization bodies such as the OGC. And the forums, I think, um, merit a little bit of a special attention because this is something uh, on top of the regular meetings, which I think are fairly obvious for, for, for communities of practice or working groups or action groups, whatever we choose to call them. But the forums really um, were a, a way in which we brought together the different COPs um, over a longer period of time, typically two to three days. Uh, again, you can see that initially we did this face to face, often back to back to an existing conference um, to, to uh, save resources. Uh, we also sponsored, we had some budgets so we could, we could fund uh, COP members to, 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 um, to, to travel to these forums. And it really provided a fantastic opportunity for, for in-depth working, uh, deeper discussions on particular issues. And it also was a very nice cross-fertilization across the COPs because we always had some joint plenary sessions. And when we had the face-to-face -face meetings, of course, we also went out for beers and drinks. Now, what did it all deliver in terms of outputs? Um, the consolidation of knowledge, which is, you know, was an overarching uh, objective, uh, resulted in an online glossary of terms and de definitions. Um, we also produced a, a number of scientific publications, two reports, uh, and uh, a number of joint conference sessions and presentations. Now, we also checked then towards the end of the last year to see, okay, how we're doing, uh, where are we going to head when we observe finishes, so we had an evaluation that we actually co-designed with our COP members to make sure we would get it uh, reasonably right. And it's nice to notice here, um, what were some of the main expectations that our members had? And we see a strong focus uh, that people were really going to join the COPs in order to network, network with relevant practitioners or other networks. Um, they also really were keen to have access to new knowledge and tools and methods relevant for them and actually also help with how do I implement these in the citizen science projects that I'm involved in right now. 
And overall, uh, we then also polled uh, to what extent have their uh, expectations for participating in the COPs been met so far, uh, that we see uh, for, for all the COPs, we have quite a considerable percentage of people who were uh, happy to a large extent and also to, to a moderate extent. Um, so this is, this is also quite a positive feedback and resonance uh, on the experience of actually participating in these communities of practice. I'd like to share with you some of the, the lessons learned now, because uh, you know having a nice scheme is, is great, but of course the devil is in the detail. Um, so I mentioned, of course, the demand-driven approach um, to the co-design of the initial objectives and having a clear action plan. Uh, we've seen previously in a work that we've done is that, that is really a strong part of making community of practice work is if there's some structure in place and somebody's leading the process and it doesn't just fizzle along. Um, but having it demand driven and being responsive to people was also important in the sense that we were trying to create an atmosphere where people could participate on the basis of what they are able to contribute. This is typically an effort on top of their regular workload. Um, so not everybody can contribute the same amount of time. Um, and some people also um, need to share what was done uh, in, in different experiments in, uh, and how to combine uh, data and services. So creating an atmosphere for that was really important. Practice what we preach regarding engagement in citizen science more, more generally. Of course, it's all about finding the right balance. Too rigorously sticking to our action plan um, could also be detrimental. So we needed to make sure there would be fresh content from the discussions. So we often invited guest speakers, either from among the COP members themselves or from uh, projects that we knew about that were working on relevant topics, etc., and brought them in. Uh, and that was really very much appreciated and gave uh, a lot of um, impetus to the, to, the, to the regular telcos. The consolidation of knowledge, I mentioned the glossary, and the glossary itself was a good tool because when we started off these communities of practice, most of them uh, would spend the first couple of sessions saying, well, what do you mean when you say engagement? What do you mean when you say co-design? So the glossary was really a tool for, for having that discussion and bringing in um, different definitions and different ways of thinking, different epistemological backgrounds here. Uh, I mentioned the joint networking, um, but also the, the reaching out. This is really to let the world know that the, that the COP exists, that it does good work, and again, it's, it's a feedback loop in terms of, are we really doing something valuable? Will people continue to make time? Do they want to continue this effort together? And last but not least, under we observe, of course, we had funding for the COP chairs for the Citizen Science Open Science COP. We don't have that funding and we can already see the, the difference, the tension that it puts on um, not only the chairs, but also having funds to allow COP members to attend face-to-face -face meetings or to send a representative of a COP to a particular um, meeting workshop to represent the COP and its findings is really important. So those resources are, are really very helpful if they can be made available. So what's going to happen with the We Observe uh, Communities of Practice? So we're talking uh, about sustainability here. Not planning for the continuation, of course, is planning to fail. So our strategy was to go back to what the premise was for setting up these communities of practice in the first place. They should exist as long as they provide value for their members. And if they no longer do, we can disband and you know everybody can focus on something else. So it was really important to gauge that interest. We did it partly through the evaluation. We did it partly also through open discussions that we had, for example, at the, the latest uh, COPS forum, which we held online. Uh, and generally, the, um, the uh, resonance was very positive. So for the time being, we're continuing. We, we observe uh, communities of practice. Um, some of them, like the, the Interop COP, um, has been linked to, to another project, the Cost for Clouds project, also funded on Horizon 2020. Uh, we may find a home and the geo, et cetera. So the different communities of practice are also looking um, whether we're, we're, we're going to be connected to different initiatives. And we have also um, submitted proposals uh, for follow-up funding so that we can have a continuous base of these financial resources that I mentioned before. And for the outputs, um, uh, it's important to make sure that once the We Observe website goes offline, which is still another three years down the line, but nevertheless, um, we have already established links to the EU citizen science um, platform, which is, uh, has a much longer lifetime. And so some of our 
outputs can be created there. So let me finish off with some, some key messages. Um, practice what we preach. I think many of us are aware just how important it is to focus on the people in citizen science, and that's exactly the same in communities of practice. They are made up of people. They have different uh, incentives, uh, barriers, interests to participate. So let's make sure um, that we set up communities of practice that really suit not only their needs, but also their means of participation. Then also the, the we observe a community of practice, we see that they're really quite well established. They've become a reference point, uh, particularly the SDG COP uh, is mentioned uh, at high level uh, policy initiatives related to the SDGs. Um, and they're here to stay, as I said, for the time being. And also the Citizen Science and Open Science COP is here to stay. So please feel free to join uh, any one of those. I've included the links here in the presentation. I can share them later in the chat. And then finally, we are writing up this whole way of which in way in which we've done the, the we observe uh, approach to COP. So how to COP, let's say the, the we observe way. So this is coming up shortly in a paper and that paper is actually written jointly by the COP chairs uh, and several of the, the COP members. So also there we're practicing what we advise for, for citizen science in terms of co-designing initiatives. So thank you very much for your attention. And let me also finish by uh, acknowledging inputs I have achieved, uh, um, received from the other two COP chairs, Dilek Fraser from IASA, who chairs the SDG COP, and Dr. Joan Bazot from CREAF, who chairs the INTEROP COP. Thank you very much. <laughs>